Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And the word of the sovereign Lord reads, Again he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Another seed fell into good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears, let him hear. When, and when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables, and he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive. And they may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and then they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation and persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of, of other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. But these are... these. But the, those that were sown in good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> As you well know, um, we've been walking through the book of Mark uh, in our series, and it's titled Following Jesus. And as we've talked about, the gospel of Mark is a fast-moving narrative um, that's about the life and the ministry of Christ, and it is action-packed and really focuses more on what Jesus does than what he actually has to say. In fact, um, the focus to this point has been on Jesus' actions rather than his teachings. In fact, we've seen several times you know, uh, that, Mark, that, that, that Mark will talk about Jesus preaching, but he doesn't really give us a lot of detail about what he's actually preaching about because the focus has been on Jesus' actions and his response to other people. Right. Well, this, as we begin chapter 4, what we're going to notice is that this changes a little bit, momentarily, because this is one of the very few teaching sections that you're going to find in the book of Mark, and, and uh, rather than what, what, uh, what Jesus is doing. In fact, this teaching section is going to go all the way to verse 34, and then Mark it will switch right back to his old uh, motif, and he will get back into the action-packed nature of the story, and it will, we'll talk about Jesus calming the storm. And this particular section right here of Jesus' teaching is really one of the most important sections in the entire book as Jesus reveals the truth about the nature of the kingdom of God. And, and in this section, Jesus reveals these truths in, in several parables, beginning with the parable of the, the sower. And, um, and, and, and that raises a the question then, what is a parable? Well, a parable simply is a story or an illustration uh, that is told to make a point. And it's not typically a historical kind of story, but rather a symbolic story that communicates an important central truth. And sometimes the point is really clear and is really easy to grab a hold of, and, and sometimes the parable just you know, needs a little bit more ex- explanation. And, and the parable of the, so- of the sower here is a story that Jesus tells to convey a vitally important truth about the kingdom of God and about the nature of salvation 
and also about the spreading of the gospel. In fact, this parable is one of the best known parables in the entire Bible, but it's also one of the most often misunderstood parables. And, and to make things even more complicated then, right in the middle of this narrative, between where Jesus tells the parable and where Jesus explains what it means, we encounter another one of Jesus' very difficult teachings. Kind of like the, 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 the warning against the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is, which is by itself a difficult teaching and a sobering warning. In the middle of this text... Right? Jesus says something that can kind of be tricky to understand and wrap your head around. And frankly, uh, the implications of what Jesus is saying here, for some people, really is kind of hard for them to accept. And, and, and this right here brings up an important issue, really about how we understand this text and, and the Bible as a whole. And the issue really is the starting point for your own theology. Now you might say, well, Sherman... <clears throat> What are you talking about? My theology. I don't care about theology. I don't know anything about theology. Right? I'm not interested in theology. Right? I, I don't even have a theology. All I know is I just love Jesus. That's it. I just love Jesus, and, and so, so there is no theology. Well, that's simply not true. Right? The reality is, you know, you might not care about theology, but if you believe anything about Christ, and if you have beliefs about salvation... Right? or if you have beliefs about God in general, you have a theology, whether you call it that or not. Right? Your beliefs, whether or not that you articulate them well, is your theology. And so, what I want you to understand, whether you acknowledge it or not, you are, you are a theologian. Okay? And you can put that on your business card if you want to. Right? Doesn't mean you're a good one, but you're a theologian in your own right. So, because you practice theology. Anytime you express your belief about God, either to yourself or to someone else, you are, are expressing your theology because your belief, the belief that you have is rooted in, in, in some understanding of God. And every Christian, no matter, no matter how mature or immature they are, they have a theology. The question then isn't, you know, you know, do I have a theology I believe, but rather is my theology, right, is my theology accurate to who God really is? That's the question we have to wrestle with. Is what I believe about God, is what I believe about salvation consistent with what the Bible actually has to say? Because your theology, right, what you believe about God influences the, your entire understanding of, of the Bible and how you live your life, especially when it comes to difficult texts like this one. Right? And that's why the starting point of your theology is so important. And what I mean by starting point is simply this is your starting point for your understanding of, of Christianity and faith in God, does it begin with you or does it begin with God? Is the center of your theology and your understanding and your thoughts, and it, you know, is, is, your center of, uh, is, is the center your understanding? Is it, is it your experiences? Is it your thoughts and musings? Is it your emotions? Or is the center of your understanding, is, is that God and what he reveals about himself, and the nature of reality as revealed in Scripture. And the reason why that I, I point this out is because, because once you understand this, you will begin to see this all around you throughout Christianity. Because there's only two basic types of theology. Now, understand, there's lots of different theological points of view on a lot of different issues. Just talk about eschatology, right? I mean, there's a lot of different points of view, but ultimately there are only two foundational starting points for a person's theo theological belief. They either start with one or the other. You either have a God-centered theology, a theology that's focused on God, or you have a man-centered theology, a system of faith that is focused on man. Is your understanding of your faith rooted in, in God and, and who he is is revealed in the word of God? Or is it rooted in who man is and how he experiences the world? Let me give you an example. Probably one of the best, clearest examples right, is the prosperity gospel. It is a belief system that's built on a man-centered theology. It's the idea that somehow you come into a relationship with God and the reason why you do that is so you can get something from God. That's the basis of the prosperity gospel. If you put your faith in God, then God somehow is obligated to make you healthy, wealthy, and happy because you believe in him. And that the point of your relationship with God is about you and about your relationship with him and your happiness and your prosperity. And the point of salvation then is about mankind and God blessing mankind. That's a man 
God-centered theology. Whereas a God-centered theology says that it's all about God and it's all for the glory of God. All of creation is for the glory of God. My entire life is for the glory of God. My prosperity or even my suffering is for the glory of God. All of history is for the glory of God. All of redemption is for the glory of God. It all points to him and in his glory. That is a God-centered theology. And I bring this up because, because so that you understand that there with these differences of starting points. And, and ultimately, because we start in different places sometimes, right, that if we do start in different places, we can speak the exact same Christian language. We can use the same church lingo, but because of our assumptions and the things that we believe that are different, we can end up in different places with our understanding of what the Bible actually has to say. Your theology and your view of Christianity and of salvation and of church and all the details that encompass your Christian beliefs must begin in one of two places. It either begins with a God-centered theology or it begins with man. It begins and it ends right there. And, and I say that because, because the way that we're, the way that we're um, going to understand this text of Scripture today is really, really, really going to depend on where you start. It's going to really depend on that. Do you, do you start with the assumption, or whether you realize it or not, that man is at the center of your theology, or do you start with that God's the center? Right? Is man the center of God's redeeming activity, or is God the center of his redeeming activity? Is the ultimate right, center of, of, of God's salvation, is that for man's good, or is it ultimately about God's glory? And the way that you understand this text and, and what, what Jesus has to say has everything to do with your starting point. And we're going to talk more about that as we get further in. But before we get into the text, let me just, let me just kind of give you, tell you where we are in the context here. As we mentioned before, we're in chapter 4, and, and, and it's another turning point in the story that's signaled by Mark, you know, focusing not on what Jesus does now, but what he's teaching, because what he's teaching here is central to the message of his entire gospel, and it's connected to everything that we have talked about to this point. If you, if you remember, Jesus, like Mark says from the very beginning, that Jesus is the Son of God, and he begins his ministry proclaiming the gospel, and he calls people to repent and believe, and not only does he preach all around Galilee, that message of hope, but, but he also does miracles to give validity and authority to his message. He heals people of the worst kinds of diseases and infirmities, and he casts out demons. Right? And, and his message and his miracles have, have brought Jesus a whole lot of attention. The crowds continue to grow everywhere he is. People want to be healed, and they want to be around Jesus. But this has also brought him into conflict then with, with the Pharisees and the scribes who were the religious authorities at the time because Jesus is threatening their religious and their political power. And, and, and through these conflicts, what we see is a very important reoccurring theme emerge in the story, a theme of those who believe versus those who don't believe, right? And what we discovered is the difference between those who believe and those who don't believe is really about the condition of their heart. Those who don't believe and reject Christ have hardened hearts, where those who do believe and accept Christ have, have, have their hearts changed. That is a theme that we see over and over again, and which led to what we talked about last week, this idea that there are those who are on the outside versus those who are on the inside. Those who are on the outside of God's family versus those who are on the inside of God's family. Those who, who believe and, and those who don't believe. And, and what we have to come to understand is that, that the world, is again, really breaks down into two types of people. We talked about this last week. You have either unbelievers and you have believers. Those on the outside and those on the inside. Those who are saved and those who are not saved. Those whose hearts that are hard and those whose hearts that have been changed. It's a very clear emerging theme from the text and it's a theme that will play an important role on how we understand what Jesus is getting at today. Now, as we consider these things, I want you to keep that in mind, um, but there's also three other important things for us to keep in mind as we look at this parable. Number one, in this parable, what we're going to see is Jesus describes four different types of soil. Right? And this, these types of soil are related to four existing heart conditions and then the response of those hearts to the word of God. And this condition right, 
right? The, the condition of the heart then determines how one responds to the gospel. And then number two, even though there are four heart conditions here that are talked about, there's still only two kinds of people. And there's still only two. Unbelievers and believers, right? There's four heart conditions, but there's still only two kinds of believers and unbelievers. And then number three, right, which is actually made evident then, whether a person is a believer or not, is made evident by the bearing of fruit or the lack of it. Right? And that's, that's what we're going to see here in the text. And this is important. These are some important things that we need to keep in mind. And we also need to keep in mind, again, the starting point of your theology. So with that extended introduction, let me look again. Let's look again at Mark chapter 4. We're going to begin in verse 1. And it reads, Again he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole world, I mean, the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things in parables. And again, this is a very familiar scene to us, right? We've seen this before. Jesus is followed around by this very large crowd, right? And it's so unwieldy that he actually has to get into a boat. He's done this before. He had to get into a boat because the crowd was so big that they threatened, it threatened to crush him and overrun him. And so he gets into this boat and lets out away from the shore a little bit so that he can preach to this big audience. And he begins to preach, right? And as he does, he uses parables. He starts teaching parables. And the first parable that he teaches here is the parable of the sower. And Jesus says, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil, and it produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he has ears to hear, let him hear. Now fortunately for us, Jesus himself actually interprets the parable for us and says, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? And what he's communicating here is that like this particular parable is like the interpretive key for the other parables, but also it's this understanding this parable is, is really important to understanding the kingdom of God and how salvation works. He goes on and says, he goes, the sower sows the word. Now, the, the, the sower in this parable is obviously Jesus, but it is also anyone who shares the gospel. Anyone who shares the gospel is a sower. Anyone who proclaims the word of God is a sower, and the seed that is being sown is the seed of the word of God. And he says, and these are the ones along the path where the word was sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word, what is sown in them. See, Jesus teaches this about the kingdom of God using the analogy right, of everyday life for, for these people who are in an agricultural society. They understand kind of what he's talking about because he's painting a picture here of this field. right? And usually around the fields are these paths right, or that, that are around the field that people walk on. It's this hard soil, right, because people have been trampling on it and, com and it's been compacted and it's hard, right? And, and so it's this path around the field and some of the seed falls on this hard path, but, but because it's hard, it doesn't penetrate and it's easily then snatched away by, you know, the, the, by the enemy. And this clearly represents, you know, I, I mean, there's not any mistaking here. It clearly represents those whose hearts are evidently hard. Right? It is clear that, that it's hard. People who reject the gospel outright. Right? In fact, of all the believers there are in the world, these are the easiest ones to spot. Right? Because they'll tell you, I'm not a believer. Right? Their hearts are so hardened that the word of God just falls on their hearts and the devil just snatches it away and it has no effect on them. It has no impact in their lives. It means nothing to them. There is no growth. There's no indication that they might be or could ever be saved. Right? They're, they're outwardly either atheists or agnostics. By the way, there's no real atheists in the world. It's just people who think they are because God says everybody knows that he exists. But they're the ones that claim to be atheists or agnostics or those who have bought into some other religion or, or a cult, and, and, and they're very clearly not Christian. Right? And, and oftentimes they will even tell you that. 
Right? Their, their hearts are, 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 are hardened. Their heart condition is that, that, that Jesus is talking about is clearly someone who is, who is an overt unbeliever. And the response to the gospel is going to be rejection. I think we've all encountered people like that where we try to tell them about the love of Christ and they're like, no, thank you. I'll stop you right there. Right? They're the easy ones to spot because the word of God has not penetrated their heart. Well, then Jesus moves on and he continues and says, And these are the ones sown on the rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on the account of the word, immediately they fall away. Now, I think this is probably the type of person that many of us really, really wrestle with in the way that we share the hope of Christ. Because it would, it would seem initially that there was new life and there was something that actually happened in their life. Only to find that they quickly had faded away. Right? Because understand, right, there are old, still only two types of people in the world. Right? There are unbelievers and you have believers. And this one clearly is not a believer. Jesus says that they received the word with great joy. Right? But then they quickly fall away. The Greek word here for fall away is the word that we get for scandal. Right? or scandalous, or scandalized. The idea that this person right, has, has fallen away and completely rejected the faith, and in fact, they've even become antagonistic. We know people like that. Oh, I used to be a Christian, but man, those people are such hypocrites, I just, nah, 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 you know? Or I used to be a Christian, but I got hurt by somebody in the church, and I, you know, I hate Jesus. It's, it's that idea. And, and the picture here that Jesus is painting is, is someone who initially hears the word of God and they hear the gospel with with great joy and great emotion accompanies this and they're excited and motivated and maybe even profess that they love Jesus and have an emotional profession of faith and then it will appear that, that, that new life actually begins in them but then, as Jesus says, they have no root within themselves, and, and the word isn't really anchored anywhere because, because, it's, because it's shallow, the soil is shallow, because underneath that shallow soil is a heart that is still hard. Which means, whatever faith they may have actually had was a superficial faith. They have a superficial heart. It's a superficial faith. It's not a saving, real faith. And there is a difference Everybody wants to, not everybody, but a lot of people want to say, well, faith is faith. No, it's not. You can have a superficial faith that you think is faith. It's not real. It's not a saving faith. And understand that Jesus doesn't say, right, I want you to hear this. Jesus doesn't say that they fall away and then eventually come back. That's not what it says here. They fall away, and it's clear that they were never, ever really a believer. They fall away and they reject Christ. Now, this is a clear indication of someone who has never been saved because they had shallow, superficial faith. No matter how much emotion they may have experienced initially when they heard the gospel. Now I want you to understand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying that the gospel should not make you emotional, because it should. It makes me emotional all the time. Like, you, you know, we, we come to the Lord's table, like I can't hardly keep, you know, keep from crying. I think about what God has done, that Jesus Christ, the perfect son of God, the, the, the perfect lamb, died on the cross for me, right? That tears me up. Emotionally, it, I mean, it, I get emotional about the gospel. When I think about what God has done for me by his grace, I get emotional. We should be emotional, right? And I'm not saying that we shouldn't receive it with great joy, because, because you should. The greatest problem you're ever going to face has been solved Right? The wrath of God that was hanging over your head because you're a sinner is done away with when you put your trust in Jesus Christ. Right? And you don't have to stand and face condemnation and an eternity in hell because of that. And not only does God give you a promise of heaven, but he promises strength here today. We should rejoice. The gospel should make our hearts rejoice. But what Jesus is clearly saying here is just because a person hears the gospel and receives it with great joy and comes forward and makes a profession of faith and, and initially seems like they have new life doesn't mean that it actually took root in them. There are some who will fall away on account of persecution. Why? Because their hearts are still hard. There's, their hearts are unchanged, regardless of what you may see on the outside initially. And when they're confronted then by, about their faith, by maybe someone that they know, or somebody they respect, and people give them a bad time, or maybe right, they, 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 they come to God and, and their life gets hard, Right? And then they look to God, and because God doesn't do what they think God should do, right, then they begin to reject him. 
because they never really knew who God was in the first place. Or maybe they'd experience friction because of their faith, maybe friction in their workplace or friction you know, in the political scheme. We certainly see more and more of that all the time. And they walk away proving that they never really even belong to God. They remain unbelievers. And then Jesus says, the others are those are the ones that, that are sown among the thorns. They are the, those who hear the word, but the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And it proves unfruitful. And what Jesus is talking about here is obviously a distracted heart. Right? But notice right, what, what, what it says here. The word fell into the soil and it was choked out by the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. This is someone who receives the word of God and even maybe makes a profession of faith, but there is no fruit in their life because their faith is choked out by everything else in the world. And, and, and this, this one here is probably the hardest one for us as Christians to detect. And it's also one of the most dangerous, especially in this culture, because so many people can slide by and pass for Christians. Because this person right here, they receive the word, and even makes a profession of faith, and even maybe even goes to church from time to time, but doesn't really outwardly deny the faith like the superficial heart, this person will probably even say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, I believe in Jesus, I love Jesus. right? And they may even have a Christian bumper sticker on their car. But when you really examine their life, there is no fruit. When you look at their life, God is not the center of their life. Maybe it's their career, maybe it is, it is their wealth. Maybe it's their social status. Maybe it's even their children. Or maybe it's in their sexual identity. There's a lot of that nowadays. What you see in their life is not a hatred for the sin that God hates, but rather a love of all the things of the world. What you will see is people who live in egregious, unrepentant sin, and they'll say, I'm a Christian, but they feel no conviction at all for the sin that they're living in. And they may even do religious things. Things. That's the scary part. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, after he tells his disciples, you will know them, you'll know a tree by, by its fruit, right? He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the ones who do, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many, okay, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, and the, 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 the Lord, Lord is an emphasis, like they really believe that they are are, are, are believers. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Then we do mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. There are those who think themselves believers, but, but are not because their hearts are filled with the love of the world and it chokes out the word of God and in their lives and they never produce the fruit of new life, indicating that their hearts have still not been changed, proving that they're still unbelievers. Because again, there's only two types of people in the world. There's believers, and then there's unbelievers. Those on the outside and those on the inside. And Jesus shows us three types here of unbelievers and their reactions to the word of God. And then he says, but those who were sown on good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. I want you to hear that, that first part again. There are three important ideas that Jesus is communicating here. There are those who, who, whose hearts are good soil, and, and they're the ones who hear the word, accept the word, and then bear fruit. There are people who hear the word of God they hear the gospel, they accept it as truth into their hearts, and the result of that is they bear fruit. That is the natural outworking of the word of God in the life of any believer is that it bears fruit. It's as natural as planting a tree in good soil. You give it enough time, it will bear fruit. You plant seeds in good soil, right? Give it enough time, it will grow and bear fruit. It is the natural outworking of the seed. And, and bearing fruit in the life of the believer is the natural outworking of the Word of God. That's just what it does. The Word of God is life. 
And those whose hearts are ready to encounter the Word of God, which, which is powerful, right? Which is, which is the power of God Himself. Those who, who are ready to encounter the Word of God, those hearts are the ones that bear fruit. The Christian life is marked by the fruit of repentance and faith. The Christian life is marked by a changed life. If the seed of God's Word falls on good soil of a person's heart, it will bear fruit. It's immutable. And it's evident because the fruit will be abundant. Look what it says. It says that it will produce 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. This is a substantial change. I mean, this is a staggering return on investments. You know, I mean, when you, if you think in agricultural terms, this, this right here was, it was a big number here. If a person hears the gospel and their heart is ready with the seed, right? the seed will grow and produce fruit. And the fruit is only born in good fertile soil of a person's heart. But notice that these four soil conditions and heart conditions, there's a commonality here. Notice that this isn't what a person does that determines what happens to the Word. It's not what a person does. It's not about their... It's not about... Anything else? It's it's about their existing heart condition. It's not about their personality. It is not about their upbringing. It's not about their about about their their propensities. It's not about their experiences. It's not about anything that anyone can do. It has everything to do with the existing condition of their hearts. And what you need to see here is that these three basic heart conditions, three of them are natural. The hard heart, just like hard dirt, is natural. Anybody who's dug around here understands that. How many of you dug a hole out here in Boron and experienced hard dirt? Yep, you know what I'm talking about. Right. It's natural. And the superficial heart, just like rocky ground, is natural. And the distracted heart, just like a weed, like weed-infested soil, is natural. Just look around. You see a lot of flowers, but there's a lot of weeds growing already. But a heart that is ready for the Word of God, just like cultivated soil, isn't natural. It requires something. It requires change. And that's what the last heart condition is. It's a changed heart. A heart that used to be hard or rocky or filled with weeds, but then God changed it. It's a heart that that has been loosened up by the Holy Spirit using the plow of conviction. It's a heart that has been, that was a heart of stone that's been transformed into a heart of flesh like God says in Ezekiel. It's a heart that has been, had all the garbage weeded out of it By God Himself. It's a heart that has been supernaturally changed by God because only God can change people's hearts. And that's the truth that we need to hold on to. Okay? I can't change people's hearts. As much as I would love to, as much influence as I would like to think that I would wield in somebody's life, I cannot change anybody's heart. And you can't either. Heck, we can't even change our own hearts. It's impossible. Only God can change people's hearts. The heart must be changed by God before the Word takes root. And so what we have here in this this last example is a heart that's changed by God, ready for the Word. The soil is a transformed heart, and because it's been transformed and made ready, when the Word falls in it, it, it takes root and it grows up bearing the evidence of salvation, which is the fruits. To which Jesus says that there is evidence that you belong to Him. In fact, he gives us two pretty clear examples of what it means to, to be his disciples and, and how people will know. One of them, he says, that the way that they know is you are to love one another as I have loved you. That we are to love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ with a, with a love like Jesus loves. That's how people are going to know that we belong to him. He also said that you're going to know that, that people are part of his family. How? Remember what we said last week? Those who, who do the will of God, those who are obedient to the will of God. He said, those are the ones that are part of Jesus' family. So if we love each other as God loved us and we do the will of God, those are going to be evidence of the fact that we belong to him. And then Jesus says elsewhere, you will know them by their fruit. You'll know them by the fruit in their lives. You will know Christians by their transformed lives because transformed lives produce abundant fruit. And, and this transformation, this fruit, right, right, and this changed heart, all of it is the work of of God. Not of man. It's God's work. 
which then gives us the interpretive key of this parable and the difficult part in, in the middle here. Because what, what, because what is the theme that we've been talking about that's been popping up over and over and over and over again to this point? What we've been seeing is a theme of hardened hearts and transformed hearts. We've been seeing those who believe because God has transformed them. And, and, and we've seen people who, who should believe, right, but refuse to even though they've seen all the evidence and been given all the information and even those who know the scriptures really well, they should believe, but they won't. They won't come to faith in Christ. Why? Because their hearts have not been changed. It's as simple as that. And, 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 and that's what, we've, what, we've, what we have here we have unbelievers and believers. We have hearts you know, that are hard versus hearts that are, that, are, that are transformed, which then points to the interpretive key of this text. I want you to notice right, what it says here, beginning in verse 10. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables, and he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. And I really want you to pay attention to how that is worded. To you, it has been given the secret to the kingdom of God. To you, it has been given. Right? To you believers, my followers, it has been given. It's been granted to you. It's been gifted to you. You see, this wasn't something that you earned. This wasn't something that you figured out on your own. This is not something that, 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 that you knew by your intellectual insights. This is not something that you seeking God on your own figured out. No, this was given to you. It was granted to you. The secrets of the kingdom have been given to you by God. It's not something that you deserved or earned. But, it says, for everyone else, those outside, he says, those outside, those who have unchanged hearts, everything is in parables. Why? Well, now we arrive at the controversial passage that so many people struggle with and, and don't want to talk about. But, but actually, this is the key to understand the entire parable, and really, it's the key to understanding the nature of salvation in the kingdom of God. It says, to those who are on the outside, everything is in parables, so that, or in order that they may indeed see, but not perceive. That they indeed may hear, but not understand. Lest, or otherwise, they should turn and be forgiven. As you kind of chew on that for a little bit, let me just read the words of Jesus again. He said, to those on the outside, everything is given in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive. And they may indeed hear, but not understand what they're hearing. Lest, otherwise, if they did perceive and understand, they should turn and be forgiven. You and I just simply need to understand what the implications are of what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying that it is not for them to perceive. It is not for them to understand because it's not for them to turn and be forgiven. That's what Jesus is clearly saying in the text here. And, and, right? and before you, know, you want to push back on that, what you've got to understand is where Jesus is coming from. Jesus is quoting from Isaiah chapter 6 in the Old Testament a passage of judgment against God's own people. God says, in Isaiah chapter 6, beginning verse 9, he says, Go and say to this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull. Listen to that. Make the heart of this people dull. And their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. It is not for some to be turned and to be healed. That's what the text says says, not, not, not what Sherman says. Now before we react to that, let's just put all the pieces together. Let's, let's look at this in its, all of its context. Okay? We have this theme of those who are either believers or unbelievers, outsiders or insiders. We have Jesus clearly declaring who he is, God in the flesh, and then he does undeniable miracles 
right, that demonstrates who he is. It's evident who he is. And we have people who hear, you know, what Jesus says and, and sees what he does, and they believe him and they follow him. And then you have people who hear what he says and see what he does, the, these incredible miracles, but, but they decide that he's, either he's crazy or he's demon-possessed and they want to they kill him and they won't believe in him. And then you have Jesus talking about these four heart conditions, three of them resulting in unbelief, one of them leading to belief and bearing fruit because the one God has supernaturally changed, right, the person's heart but not the others. And then Jesus says here to, that some, those who are on the inside, those who believe have been given by the grace of God, they've been given the ability to understand the secrets of kingdom of the kingdom, but those on the outside, they don't, not, they not, not only don't, they, do they not have the secrets, but they're going to be left blind and deaf, spiritually speaking, and unchanged and fruitless in their hearts. Where does, where does that lead us then? What's the overarching theme that Jesus is, is, what's the point he's making here? Well, I think Paul, the apostle, he really gets to the heart of the matter. In, in Romans chapter 9, he writes, he says, for he, God, says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion, so that it depends not on human will, it depends not on human will, but nor exertion, but on God who has mercy, so then he has mercy on whom he wills, and he hardens whom he wills. The overarching point that Jesus is making here is not that we need to try to till the soil of people's hearts, is that what we need to do is we need to trust that God is sovereign over everything, including salvation. That salvation is 100% the work of God. The only way the word of God is going to take root in anyone's heart and, and bear fruit of salvation is for it to fall in a heart that's been changed and cultivated by God himself. Otherwise, it will not bring life. Even if it's received with great joy and great emotion, if the heart is not changed, hear me, if the heart is not changed, there is no salvation. That's why we say over and over again, Jesus didn't come to change your behavior. He came to change your heart. And the thing that we need to come, come to terms with is the truth that God doesn't change every heart. And that's the implication of what we see here. And whether or not you will accept that truth or whether you will reject that truth ultimately will depend on where you start in your theology. Is your theology of God centered on who he is and what he says? Or is it centered on man and who he thinks he is and what we think he might deserve and what we think is fair? Does God decide who gets saved or does man does, is God the one who, who changes hearts, or, or, or does man? Is, is, is God the Lord of all, or is he the Lord of most things, and man's the Lord of a little bit of stuff? Is, is salvation 100% the work of God, or is it 99.99999%, and then the rest, tiny little bit, is man? Whether or not you believe this truth will depend on your starting point. God is sovereign over salvation, and he is the one that changes hearts of some and not others. But what you need to realize is, though you might not think it is, this is actually good news. This is good news, right? Because God is the one that's in control of salvation, and you're not, and I'm not. And if you were in control of salvation, then we wouldn't be saved. Praise the Lord that he's the one that's in, in control of salvation. And what we can, because he is in control of salvation, what we can do then as, as brothers and sisters in Christ is we can rest in him. Right? Because if you don't rest in him, if he's not in control of salvation, then what you're going to do and what I'm going to do is we're going to try to take on too much responsibility as if it's our responsibility to bear. If we lose sight of the truth that we are completely dependent upon Christ to do His part, and that God must be the one to change the condition of the soil of someone's heart, and that God does for some and not others, if we lose sight of that, what will end up happening is we're going to be prone to believe that another person's salvation is going to be dependent upon us and what we do or what somebody else does. If your mom, that, that your mom's salvation, that your grandma's salvation, that your neighbor's salvation, that your kids' salvation is dependent upon you. 
Because if God isn't the one in control of that, then it's up to you to beg them and convince them and to answer every possible single question that that they might have and live a perfect life that never causes them to stumble and never look negatively at Jesus Christ and that you have to continually pester them and plead with them and, and ask them, please, 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 just at least just try Jesus. If your kids don't get saved, you're going to think it's your fault that somehow you didn't say enough or do enough. But brothers and sisters, that is not even your responsibility. You can't bear that kind of weight and that kind of pressure. Only God can change hearts. God only can cause the seed to take root. Only God can make it grow. Only God can bring salvation. And He does for some by the counsel of His will and mercy, and others, He doesn't. That's what he's clearly saying here. The only, only the hearts that receive the word of God, right, that bear the, the fruit of salvation are the hearts that are changed by God himself. And what we're left with is all we've ever really had in the first place is to trust in God. That's all you ever had anyway, Christian. That's all you will ever have in this life is your faith in him. Nothing to salvation do you bring. Nothing in your hands do you bring. Only to the cross of Christ do you cling. That is all that you have is to trust God. That God will do what God will do. That God will do what is right. And to trust that God will do what is just. And to trust that God will do what is good because we know His character and His nature. What is left for us to do is to let God be God. We need to do our part and then let him do his. Now, in light of that, what do do we do with that? I mean, now that we understand what he's saying about the condition of these people's hearts, and then we understand that God is sovereign over this entire process, and only he really can apply the plow of conviction to change a person's heart, we we understand, right? And we understand that that there are going to be people we're going to witness to who are going to receive the word, and and it's just going to bounce off of them, and they're not going to be changed, and they're they're going to reject it. And there are going to be people that we're going to share the, our hope with and that it's going to seem like something grows in them and we're going to be excited about that and we're going to pray for them and we're going to rejoice with them, right? And we're going to try to disciple them and be there for them and do whatever we can for them, but ultimately they're just going to fall away, breaking our hearts and we're going to wonder what happened. And then there are those people we know that, that we're going to sow the seed of word in their, in their life and it seems like that, 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 that it took, you know, and, and they're starting to, to kind of come around to church, but really their life isn't changing and just proving that there's no fruit in their lives. But then we're going to... St- Sow the seed in, in some people's lives, and you're going to see a transformation that you're going to know it's from God, and you're going to see it bear fruit in their lives, right? Now that we understand all of that and get that, what do we do now in light of that? What does this mean for us? Because I've, I've heard people say, well, if God is sovereign, then like you say he is, then what is even the point? He's sovereign. You don't need me. Why should I even bother? Why should I even try? Right? I mean, if, if it's the way you think it is, then, then there's not even a point for us to evangelize. Well, if that's the way that you think, then your theology is still man-centered, right? Because you're thinking about yourself and you're not understanding that God, in his sovereignty, decrees both the ends, what happens, and the means, how it happens. And it is God's completely explicit, declared intention and desire and will to bring about salvation through all of us. God has made it really clear that we are to have a hand in that process. We are to be instruments in the hand of God. As instruments, we have no power of our own, but in the hand of God, He can wield us and and wield mighty power. And the result of that is going to be salvation for other people, and the mechanism is going to be the gospel being shared and proclaimed and preached by broken vessels like us, because God in His goodness has decided that all of us should have a hand in that. And what that means then for us is we need to simply trust and understand that only God knows the ends. And and only God knows whose hearts will change. And and only God knows who he's going to save. And and guess what? We ain't God, which means we don't know. And we won't know. All we know is what God is telling us to do. And what he's telling us to do by his declared will is to sow the seed. That's what he's telling us to do. Sow the seed. That is the job that we have to do as we go out into the world and we share the gospel with everyone. Everyone. 
Right? And we never ever assume a person's destiny. We don't ever assume, well, this person's going to heaven, this person ain't going to heaven. We never assume, right, right, who will and won't accept Christ. I'm not even talking to them because there's no way. No, we don't ever assume any of that. Our job is to sow the seed. And it doesn't matter what kind of soil that we encounter. We just are to call to sow the seed. We need to simply just sow it and sow it and sow it and keep sowing it and keep sowing it and never, ever stop sowing it. And we are to never... You know, we're not to worry, Lord, is this the right kind of ground? Am I, am I in fertile soil here? Right? Lord, is, is this person's heart ready? No, we're to continually sow the seed far and wide, everywhere we go, for everyone we come in contact with, knowing, believing that if we do the part that we're called to do, then God's going to do the part that he has determined to do. And so we're to sow the seed. And then we are to love the people. We're not to trample on the seed by being jerks. Right? We're to love the people. Right? We don't only tell people about Jesus, but we show them the living example of his love. We help them to see what a transformed life actually looks like. Right? And we love them just like Jesus loves them, which is sacrificially and actively and, and practically. And then... We pray for them. God, change their hearts. Right? We appeal to the sovereignty of God and we ask Him, Lord, change their hearts. Make them new. Right? How many of you guys have actually seen uh, the Lee Strobel's um, Case for Christ, his, like his, his biography movie? Okay. A couple of you, okay. Well, there's this part in here, his wife, who, who became a Christian, he's an atheist, and she obviously is sowing the seed and, and telling about Jesus, but he gets very confrontational, and she just kind of keeps doing it. But behind the scenes, she's praying one prayer over and over again. Change his heart. Change his heart. Lord, change their hearts. Make them new. Give them new life. Lord, take out of them the heart of stone and put in them the heart of flesh. Lord, save them. Because only he can. And then there's one more slide. It's not on your paper. And then we never give up. We never, ever, 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 ever give up on them. We continue to minister to them. Even if what we see in them isn't good. Even if what we see in them is, is the worst kind of addiction. Even if what we see in them is the worst kind of sin. Even if we, what we see in them is just an open hatred and rebellion against God. Even if what we see in them is they think they're a Christian, but they are obviously not. You know, We don't give up on them. We don't give up on them. We don't give up on them. We continue to love them and pray for them over and over again. We continue to sow the seed. We continue to love them. We continue to pray for them in the cycle over and over again, hoping against hope, knowing, right? Knowing that God, by his sovereign power, can save anyone at any moment, even at the last moment, like the thief on the cross. Our job is to sow the seed. And love the people. Pray for the hearts to be changed and never give up on them. And to trust for God to do his part. Knowing that all that he does, whether we see it or not, is always good. It's always just and always right. And he works all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And all he does is always, always for his, his glory. And as we wrap up, I just want to bring your hearts to the same place that we always come to. If you're someone who has not ever really trusted in Christ and you've been rejecting him, or maybe you're someone who thought you were and rejected him, or maybe you think that thought you were a Christian, but you realize my life hasn't changed at all, and I need Jesus desperately, then I will always exhort you to the same thing. Turn to the Lord. Repent of your sins and, and believe the gospel that Jesus... The Son of God came to the earth, lived a perfect life on your behalf, and traded places with you. He died on the cross for your sins, and then in return gives you his righteousness that you, can, that, that you need to stand before God, and is resurrected and now stands at the right hand of God interceding for you. That all you need to do is repent and believe that, and you are saved. I'll stand with you on that. And then if you are someone who is already a Christian, then I exhort you the same thing, that we just continue in that. That we, as Christians, though we might bear fruit in our lives, we're not going to be perfect. We will still fall down. 
We will still sin and make mistakes. But the evidence of the fact that we have changed is the fact that we will continue to repent and believe. And we will continue to repent and continue to believe that that, that, that repentance and faith continues. And guess what? Some of you might have to repent every single day of the same thing. That's kind of the way it is sometimes. But ultimately, that's the sign that you belong to him, is that you walk in that continual repentance and faith. But, but as we wrap up, let me just exhort you to this. Right? The sovereignty of God is, the great, is great news for us because what it means is we are not the authors of our own salvation and we aren't the ones responsible to save everyone else. We're just responsible to do the part that we're called to do, which is to faithfully sow the seed of God's word and to love people with a reckless abandon and pray for them unceasingly and never give up on them. We do our part, God will do his part, and when we get to heaven, we will see probably more than you could possibly imagine people that God has rescued by his sovereignty. And we, I promise you, we will stand before him and we will rejoice and sing glory hallelujah for what he has done. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the fact that you are so sovereign and powerful and that all things, Lord, reside in your hand. And Father, that it's a mystery to me. That Father, it's just something that I just don't fully understand at times. And that Father, that sometimes I want to pick up the mantle of responsibility and make it my own, that somehow, some way, I'm the one that's responsible. But ultimately, I know it is you by your hand. What I'm responsible to do is to be faithful to preach your word. And if your word offends some, then, then your word says that it does, right? But if your word falls on the right kind of soil that you have prepared, that Lord, you promised that it would bear fruit. And so my job isn't to know. My job is just to do. And Father, I trust in that, that you're going to faithfully continue to do what you do through all of us, Lord. And I pray that you'd embolden all of us, Lord, then to be sowers of the word, that we would go out to every corner of this community and sow the seed of your word over and over and over again until all hearts have turned to you and put their trust and faith in you. And I pray, Father God, that through this little church that you would raise up a people who are passionate for your name and that we're willing to share the hope of Christ in this community and around the world. And I pray your blessing over every family here and meet and you would meet their individual needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.